Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. You are tuned into Apex Express on KPFA, bringing you an Asian and Asian American view from the Bay and around the world. I'm Tara Dabrabji, kicking it with you on this Thursday night. Tonight on Apex, we'll be talking with poet Shivani Narang about her performance in Aperture, an arts festival featuring emerging Asian artists presented by Kearney Street Workshop. Then we'll be taking it global, hearing an interview with detained Kashmiri human rights advocate Karam Pervez, who was taken into custody on his way to testify before the UN about atrocities committed by the Indian state forces in Jammu and Kashmir. Karam's detention comes amidst widespread protests in Kashmir. Since July 2016, 82 civilians have been killed and over 11,000 civilians wounded in protests. Then we'll be in conversation with Kathy Jetnal Kijner, a Marshallese poet, writer, performance artist, and journalist. We'll be talking with her about the International Court of Justice's judgment that rejected a bid by the Marshall Islands to sue the world's nuclear powers for failing to disarm. We have all that and more, so keep it locked. You're tuned into you, Apex Express on KPFA. I'm Tara Dabrabji kicking it with you tonight. Human rights advocate Karam Pervez was detained on September 16, 2016. He was on his way to the 33rd UN Human Rights Council session in Geneva, planning to brief UN bodies, including the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and foreign governments on the atrocities committed by Indian state forces in Jammu and Kashmir. Kashmir is the most densely militarized land on earth. There have been more than 8,000 disappearances and 70,000 deaths resulting from India's occupation of Kashmir. Over 60,000 cases of torture have been committed in Indian-administered Kashmir. Koram Pervez is the program coordinator for the Jammu Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society, and his arrest comes amidst widespread protests, which started in July 2016. Since then, there have been 82 civilians killed and over 11,000 wounded in massive protests calling for independence. Over 70 days of curfews have have been enforced in Kashmir. Communication systems and mobile systems continue to be routinely suspended. Just this last Monday, the local newspaper, the Kashmiri Reader, was banned. Karam Parvez was en route to brief the UN on human rights violations in Kashmir, and he is currently being detained under the Public Safety Act. The Public Safety Act of 19 1978 permits the incarceration of civilians for up to two years on grounds of unconfirmed suspicion. We have with us on the line author Zia. She is an assistant professor of anthropology and gender studies at the University of Northern Colorado. She's also a poet and founder of Kashmir Lit. And um, author Zia, welcome to Apex Express. Welcome. Thank you so much, Tara. Yeah, I'm sorry that we're talking under such dire circumstances. Um, Karam Parvez, a friend, colleague, and peace advocate, recently um, detained. When did you receive the news that Karam had been detained? 
Well, uh, we were in uh, knowledge of his, uh, when he was uh, stopped at the airport on 14th, uh, that was at the New Delhi airport, uh, on, on, on route to Geneva. Uh, after he returned back to Kashmir, between the night of 15th and 16th September, he was uh, taken to the police station. Initially, uh, he did not realize that he was being arrested. He even um, decided to take his own car, which he was not allowed to do. And finally, he was put in uh, police custody for five days. And on 20th September, the judge ruled that the detention was unlawful and uh, asking the police to release him. But that did not happen. Uh, The government and the police, they prepared a dossier under the Public Safety Act, uh, which is also called the Lawless Law. And um, Amnesty has uh, endorsed it as such. And uh, Quran was detained under that. And uh, today he is uh, detained 300 kilometers away from Srinagar in a jail known as Kot Balwal. And Arthur, um, tell us, you know, a little bit about Quram. He's a human rights advocate. He's one of the most amazing people I've met in my life, a friend, um, a father. Well, uh, Quram is, uh, he's a friend to me, and he's an amazing person. He's a role model, and he's one of the most uh, brave and most vocal voices of Kashmir today. Uh, he's a human rights activist and a relentless uh, votary of social justice. And uh, he's the coordinator for Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society. He's the chairperson of the Association of Federation Against Involuntary Disappearances. He's also the recipient of 2006 Re- Reebok Human Rights Award. And he's, he's all these people, and he's also a Kashmiri who is a votary of... Uh, a people's will and desire for self-determination and uh, and he does amazing work across uh, Kashmir and also outside Kashmir as the chairperson of Afad and you can see the kind of work that he does and the kind of endorsement his work has received even after being detained Amnesty International Human Rights Watch Lawyers Right Watch Canada everyone has come out and they have really uh, you know plead and they have written against his illegal detention and then you also have uh, 50 high profile people including Noam Chomsky and Arundhati Roy speaking for him and speaking against his illegal det- uh, detention and uh, you still have people come out from woodwork supporting his work and you know that this is a legitimate work that he does with the UN bodies and uh, so many of his rights as a human rights defender have been trampled upon India, which is a state party to ICCPR, and uh, by doing this to Khurram right from the point when he was detained at the Indira Gandhi National Airport en route to Geneva, uh, to the day when he was detained and then when he was shifted uh, to Kot Balwal under PSA. So this is all against what India has signed to as ICC, uh, under ICCPR. So we kind of see <clears throat> how... His legitimate work has been uh, has really been trampled upon, and this is his work that goes on with the UN bodies, and this is his work that goes on with other human rights organizations, and the, he was also uh, presenting. Uh, his testimony was on the uprising that is happening in Kashmir right now, and he was to report on the events on the ground uh, before he was detained and before he was sent back from the airport. Arthur, I want to go to an interview that I'd done with um, Koran Parvez back in 2011, but before we go to there, how can people um, support the call to free Koran? Well, uh, the JKCCS Quorum's organization has started a free uh, Quorum campaign, and they have a WordPress site, they have a YouTube, they have a Twitter and a Facebook, and they have laid down detailed uh, uh, you know, steps on what to do. People can write to senators, people can write to Amnesty, who have endorsed uh, Quorum's work and have uh, requested uh, the government and have uh, appeals to the government of Kashmir to release him. So people can write to senators, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, uh, you know, they can sign uh, the petition that is on the website. They also will find a sample letter so they don't have to write anything anew that they can use as cut and paste and send it to whoever it is they feel can be helpful for uh, Quorum's release. 
That's free Quram. That's K H U R R A M dot WordPress dot com slash black slash blog. Free Quram. Um, thank you so much, author, for joining us. We're going to go right now to an interview with Quram Pervez, who is being detained by the Indian government. This was an interview from 2011 when I was in Srinagar, Kashmir. This is Tara Darabji reporting for Pacifica Radio from Srinagar, Kashmir. I'm speaking with Quram Parvez. He's a freedom fighter, truth teller here in the world's most densely militarized land. And I mean, you really grew up in a state of occupation under siege, seeing, witnessing the land transform, covered with graveyards. How did you get started in this work? In 1990, when I was just 14 years old, my maternal grandfather was part of a protest demonstration. There were 10,000 people. They were protesting against the molestation of women in the old city area of Srinagar. There was an unwarranted and disproportionate use of violence, direct firing on the people. One of the first massacres of 1990, in which 52 people were killed, my grandfather was also one of them. The person who had ordered the firing was my next door neighbor, and I had to live with it, that he was there and I was a student of seventh standard. I grew up thinking of revenge. I grew up thinking of this injustice because my grandfather was very close to me. He was someone who had taught me why justice is important, why we should be always thinking of being just ourselves. His words would always remind me of what my revenge should be. Other young Kashmiris of my generation became militants. I could have also become militant. But I think my grandfather's teachings provoked me to think more in terms of achieving justice and speaking truth. In this culture in, of impunity, becoming violent is very easier, but speaking truth is difficult. We may not be able to change much today, but we will set an example for our future generations. What Kashmiri people have faced in last 22 years is a full-blown war, and the resilience of people of Jammu and Kashmir is admirable, is something which is worth sharing with the world. We have refused to agree to uh, an indignified life. I'm Tara Darabji for Pacifica Radio in Srinagar, speaking with Koram Parvez, freedom fighter, truth teller, here in the most densely militarized land on earth, continuing the struggle, keeping the stories alive. And, you know, as the independence movement really grows and popularity and is gaining tremendous strength right now in Kashmir. One of the big questions is, what does that independence look like? And I know that coming out of Kashmir in this painful, long, one of the most brutal occupations in the story of the world, a beautiful new vision is being birthed. And really pushing beyond the nation state, pushing beyond the underpinnings of the neoliberal facets of capitalism. Living in Kashmir from last 20 years, the kind of occupation which we have seen from the Indian government is very ruthless. Uh, we have more than 600,000 soldiers. In, and what's in, the population? 600,000 soldiers to what? To, Civilian population. To a population of 12 million people. In Iraq, when there was a full-blown war going on, the number of soldiers operating on behalf of the Allied forces was only 170,000. In Afghanistan, where there is a very open, clear war, and Afghanistan is a very big country as compared to Kashmir, the number of NATO forces is just 190,000. So one of the future visions for Jammu and Kashmir is that we do not want militarization at this place because we will not be able to defend ourselves against these nuclear giants, India, Pakistan and China. So we will have to evolve other means to protect ourselves. So that's one. But then also when we think of a future Kashmir, we cannot repeat the mistakes of other countries. What has happened in India, what has happened in Pakistan, what has happened in Bangladesh, what has happened in many other countries around the world, these people who fought for independence against the monsters became monsters themselves. Kashmir tomorrow 
has to be a place where absolute democracy is practiced and democracy is part of our faith is not just a mere slogan we would want to be a country which practices democracy which practices humanitarian values at the grassroots level tell us a little bit about the summer uprisings how long were they how many people the 2008 and 2010 summer uprisings were huge the number of people was uh, 1 million and at some days it was more than 1.5 million people participating in a huge protest rally more than 142 civilians were killed last year and 120 out of them were killed in protest demonstrations and this was the response of the indian state and according to the government more than 5000 people were arrested and 90% out of them were tortured as well but despite all that for four and a half months the protests continued this struggle against indian hegemony against indian brutality has to be ethical resistance can never be unethical and that gives me hope that future of jammu and kashmir is not dark this conflict has made us understand many many dark sides of militarism many dark sides of racism because we have faced racism from the indian state so brutally i'm tar jarabji for pacifica radio in conversation with goram parvez freedom fighter truth teller and in our final minutes um you've grown up in this very brutal oppressed environment and one of the things that struck me about you is you have a very great sense of humor a lot of light that you carry with you um in your interactions with people and a certain hope and optimism that shines through how do you feed this part of yourself we have seen suffering very closely i have seen suffering very closely my, my very close relatives friends have died one of the things which became a driving force for me is the trust which people have reposed in me I cannot think of betraying them but then our resistance has to be creative and if we survive with of course hope i think the future holds a uh, lot of good things for us we are hopeful of success and one of the hopes for success is the tremendous courage which people have shown uh, people sometimes tell us that human rights activists are courageous true because we actually invite troubles i mean we are so stupid people everywhere in the world that we know the consequences of whatever is going to happen but despite all that we embrace problems in 2004 my car was attacked and my colleague asia jalani she was killed and my driver was killed on the spot and i uh, was also injured i was hospitalized for 45 days and i lost my right leg it was amputated i remember when it happened i was asked by one of my very close friends he said that did we not tell you every time that these would be the consequences and i smiled at him and i said that did i not ever knew myself that this would happen i was sure that something would happen but i'm thankful to god that it's only one leg which has gone i still have two more arms and i still have my leg with which i can continue to do what i have to do we don't have many choices here in jammu and kashmir the only choice which we have is to live and we cannot live without the struggle for dignity we cannot live without the struggle for freedom and i think this is the best i could do with my life and if people out there want more information they want to support this struggle what are some good websites well we have our website uh, the www.kashmirprocess.org and then we have another website called jkccs.net net jkccs.net and the other one is www.kashmirprocess.org that was the voice of koram parvez i'm tara darabji for pacifica radio thank you so much for being with us thank you so much for having me here we'll continue to follow the story your work and your existence of resistance thank you very much for kpfa radio pacifica tara darabji sirinagar kashmir all the fallen in the garden of remembrance like a sufi and now you swell in my thoughts this is the sounds of mc cash 
You are tuned into Apex Express on KPFA. I'm Tara Darabji. Yesterday, October 5th, 2016, the International Court of Justice, the United Nations highest court, rejected a bid by the Marshall Islands to sue the world's nuclear powers for failure to disarm under their obligation in the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. The court ruled that it did not have jurisdiction because there was no evidence of legal dispute that it could adjudicate. The people living in the Republic of the Marshall Island continue to be impacted by the legacy of nuclear weapons tests. The U.S. conducted 67 nuclear tests in the Republic of the Marshall Islands from 1946 to 1958. These tests are equivalent to 1.7 Hiroshima bombs being exploded daily for 12 years. Daily for 12 years. Health effects from the nuclear weapons testing include jellyfish babies, children who were born without arms or without heads, brains, but with a heart that still beats. The lawsuit sought no monetary compensation, but moved to compel the nuclear weapons nation signed on to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to commence negotiations to achieve nuclear disarmament by 2020. We have with us to discuss the ruling, Kathy Jetnell Kijiner, a Marshallese poet, writer, performance artist, and journalist. And we're also joined by Rick Wayman, the program director for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Welcome to Apex Express. Thanks, Tara. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for both joining us tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your Thursday night. Um, Let's start out with Rick. Can you tell us the significance of the ruling by the international court that they dismissed the case? Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, as you said in your intro, the uh, the court decided not to hear the cases on the merits. Uh, so there, we had oral hearings in The Hague. Uh, the Marshall Islands legal team uh, spent uh a number of days in the hague uh laying out their cases but but not not talking about the real issues not talking about how the countries are are not disarming they they were forced to talk about how uh this application is ad- admissible uh why the marshall islands does have a dispute here uh, so, so very kind of low le- level legalistic stuff, and uh, and not really getting into the meat of the issues, and uh, and that's a real shame. Uh, I I strongly believe that the Marshall Islands uh, had had a, a very strong case, uh, what well, cases uh, against the UK, India, and Pakistan. And uh, and and that the court should have gone ahead and heard them. Uh, it, it's it's really a, I think a missed opportunity by the court, and uh, and one that that does not send a, a strong a reassuring message to countries that that when they have a problem they can resolve resolve their issues peacefully through the rule of law. Kathy, what are your thoughts on the ruling? Um, yeah, I, I would say. Uh, it's definitely really disappointing. You know, I was I was hoping for the best as well. And considering everything our country has been through and our people have been through, um, if they had just heard our stories and you know understand how it's affecting us even till till today, you know, I think they should have ruled. You know, obviously in the in favor of us. But at the same time, to me, you know, this is a huge step for us that we took this case this far. And that we we pick this up, this fight up after so many years of it laying dormant, and so it's inspirational for me. For me, it just means we got to keep fighting and we got to keep moving forward. And Kathy, you talked a little bit about the impacts um, that exist to this day in the Marshall Islands from those sixty-seven <laughs> nuclear tests. Can you talk a little bit about how that's affected you and your community? Well, um, you know, we still have some of the highest cases of uh, cancer in the world because of the fact that, you know, we were exposed to all of that radiation. 
Um, some of our islands are still uninhabitable, uh, the islands that they tested on. We literally lost some of our islands. They were vaporized off of the, you know, off the map completely. Uh, we have communities that were displaced and can no longer ever return back to their islands. Uh, and they're living on islands that are, you know, have poor resources and on top of everything is now having to deal with the rising sea level due to climate change. Um, we also have an island called the Runa Dome that, that is covered with, that is just basically all of this nuclear waste, you know, covered under the cement and that's leaking, you know, into the ocean. So in so many ways, it's affecting our health and it's affecting our community and our, and our identity as a people. So I would say the case, the cancer though is, is the most tangible, you know, it, uh, effect. The fact that we have so many people we've lost, including me, I've lost my, both my grandparents to cancer. Both of them were actually slated to be compensated for cancer treatment, and yet they died before they could receive it. So did my niece. My niece just passed away recently from cancer. Uh, my nephew, my aunt just battled cancer recently. So there's, it's, it's just rampant in our community. Yeah, I'm so sorry for your loss and, you know, the experience within your family. And when did you first realize that nuclear weapons testing had happened in the Marshall Islands. Was it something that you just grew up understanding or was there a moment when you sort of understood the impact of the cancers and the sickness that you were seeing around you being connected to the nuclear weapons testing? Well, uh, I definitely saw, I definitely grew up with an awareness of it, but not fully understanding what it meant until I decided to do a history project on it when I was about 15 years old. And that's where I really dug into the history and, and started to understand just how widespread this issue is and how, you know, devious and how um, <clears throat> how much it, it, it damaged our, uh, our island. So that was when I really began to learn the hard facts was when I was 15 years old. But I basically grew up understanding that, oh, you know, this is something that happened to us uh, once you know, and there are people who die because of it, you know, that was just kind of something you, everyone goes up understanding. Um, when you were 15 and you started researching it, what were some of the most shocking things that you uncovered? Uh, well, I think the most shocking thing for me, and, I, and I've written about it, was that um, they had actually tested at one point, uh, they had put a, a bunch of goats on a ship and they tested, uh, when they tested the nuclear weapons, there was, all, uh, according to a, a caption, so basically, let me, sorry, let me start over. There's a photograph of goats on a ship, and on the, on the caption of the photo, it says, goats were tested on naval ships. Um, thousands of letters flew in protesting animal abuse. That probably really angered me the most because I didn't see much protest coming from anywhere else in regards to the Marshall Islanders themselves who were a part of the test and, you know, who were losing their islands and their homes and their lives. That was definitely one of the more shocking ones. But the, the most shocking was her, the different, uh, the personal accounts of jellyfish babies, you know, babies born with no limbs, babies born with their brains outside of their head, like, you know, these horrible, horrible traumatic events for so many women as a result of this testing. And Kathy, I know you're a poet. Um, I don't know. I, I'm guessing you don't have anything to share with us just because you're at the grocery store. <laughs> but do you, no. uh, did you, do you have a piece you want to drop or is that... Um... I, I, I actually do. It's, it's okay because I went to the grocery store and I brought my laptop with me. So. Nice. That's what we do. We roll as poets, right? We roll with our computers now <laughs> like, a, like another appendage. <laughs> Well, we'd, yeah, love, we'd um, love to hear a piece of yours. There's a piece that actually just won um, the Nuclear Peace Poetry Prize uh, Award. Uh, I just found out, actually. And um, it's a piece about my niece. So I mentioned that my niece had just battled cancer and passed away. She battled uh, the cancer of leukemia. And this is a poem that I wrote for her. So I'll just read this one. It's a short piece. It's called Fishbone Hair. <clears throat> One, inside my niece Bianca's old room, I found two Ziplocs stuffed with rolls and rolls of hair, dead as a doornail, black as a tunnel hair, thin as strands of tumbling seaweed. Maybe it was my sister who stashed away Bianca's locks so no one could see, trying to save that rootless hair, that hair without a home. It all fell out. Two, the marrow should have worked. They said she had six months to live. 
three. That's what doctors told the fishermen over 50 years ago while they were out at sea just miles away from Bikini, the day the sun exploded. Four. There is an old Chamorro legend that Guahan was once attacked by a giant monster fish. The women, guided by their dreams, hacked off their hair, wove their locks into a massive, magical net. They caught the fish. They saved their island. Five. Thin, rootless, fishbone hair. Black night sky, catch ash, catch moon, catch stars. For you, Bianca. For you. With the voice of Kathy Jentlin Kinjener reading a poem. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. We just have a few minutes left. Um, and, you know, what... What is next? Um, you mentioned at the beginning that this lawsuit really inspired you to keep the struggle alive and keep moving forward. Um, what are plans? How can people get involved? Uh, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure yet. Uh, I feel like I have to regroup with the same team that pushed forward that lawsuit to find out how exactly, you know, we can push forward. You know, we have that there was a, a, a petition online that was signed by thousands of people supporting our lawsuit, and yet it still didn't move forward. So we have to just keep raising awareness, you know, sounding the alarm wherever we can go. And I think uh, for me, I would personally, like in my regards, I would like to connect more with communities, other communities that have helped, had to deal with nuclear issues. I'd like to connect with them more, and I would continue writing about it and continue raising awareness um, through my poetry on it. Yeah, thank you for your poetry. And Rick, are you still with us? I am, yeah. Great. Where can people find out more information um, about the Marshall Islands and next steps as they evolve? Sure. Well, the uh, the campaign website that is tracking the uh, the lawsuits is www dot nuclear zero dot org and i do want to point out while the international court of justice uh dismissed these cases there is still a case pending in the ninth circuit court of appeals against the u.s so uh the marshall islands filed cases against all nine nuclear armed nations at the international court at the same time they filed an additional case against the u.s here in U.S. court. So that one is still alive. And, uh, and so, so we are holding out hope that, uh, that there will be some recourse on this issue coming through the courts before too long. Well, since the U.S. is the world's global nuclear weapons leader, um, we'll continue to follow that case and see how it goes. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, Tara, thank you so much, and, and thanks for having me to track this. Yeah, and Kathy, if people want to follow your work and your poetry, how can they catch you? Um, I have a blog site right now. It's called www.kathyjetnokitchener.com. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, you know. <laughs> All right. So, yes, they should be able to find me. Just put my name in. Cool. We'll follow you on Cyberspace. Thank you so much for joining us on the airwaves tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're tuned into Apex Express. We'll be right back after a short music break. Sabbath thoughts addictive to your system. Intervals of time make us selective. Penetrate your earlobe and all of your protection. Complications help provide back in your eye. Fake lead, only for the best interest. I rebel flagrant, the sea fragrance is showed up. Older since we give two tools on topple. The salmonized crumple, renegize hope, then the sword down slope. The truth emerges, finding the coin drops. Or to be which like Salem's are prisons or preachers. I'm an atheist, glad to meet ya. Wait for consciousness in my Pacific. Remember it to ghouls and optics Just to switch so Catholic Perception, dimension on this tomb called religion Or just to ruin slenderly Over greed, folks hope so feed Believes in hierarchy, Jews were furthest This ring of fire is only true in real science of English monarchy Breeds state facts about the original man Free five hold on, Polynesians are rich on Pacific Basin, my backyard can folk Soft spoken relapse, raps crush Venues to mice collapse that was Reverse Resistance by King Kapisi. You're listening to Apex Express on QPFA. I'm Tara Dorabji kicking it with you on this Thursday night. 
And Aperture 2016 is going down. Kearney Street Workshop brings the voices of the Bay Area's emerging Asian and Pacific American artists into focus in Aperture 2016, titled Here This Year. Aperture holds a space for emerging artists to develop their art, affirm their voices, and share their work with the community. Over the course of three weekends, from September 30th to October 15th, they'll be presenting six showcases highlighting the work of six featured artists who are tasked with creating a new piece for the festival and over 60 showcase artists representing the many cultures that exist under the Asian Pacific American umbrella. Up next, we go to a piece by Apex contributor Sierra Lee, who caught up with poet Shivani Narong, who will be performing at Aperture's Literary Arts Showcase on Friday, October 7th, that's tomorrow night, at the Art Gallery Studios. We go now to Sierra Lee in conversation with poet and Aperture performer Shivani Narong. Hi, Shivani. Thank you so much for being with us today. So... Shivani, you're a student, you're an organizer, you're a writer, a poet, that you're relatively new to slam poetry, but have you always been a writer? So I started writing, like putting pen to page in junior year of high school. And that was because of a teacher I had in my life, my English teacher, who was kind of helping me navigate um, different emotions I was dealing with and different things that were going on in my life. And so I reached out to him and he said that poetry helps him process. And so he asked me to try it. And that's when I started writing for myself mainly. But again, I just started sharing towards the end of last year. That's pretty incredible considering that, you know, you just are kind of finding your way to slam poetry, and yet you competed in and won the You Speaks Grand Slam this past June. How did it feel to perform in the semifinals? It was kind of unreal because when I signed up for the first bout of the Youth Speak Slam, I didn't never really expect it to keep going. And so when when I kept going to the semifinals and then when I went to finals, each one was a gift. And so I was like, okay, now I got to prepare for this. And I'd never been to the venue. So I didn't really know what I was expecting either. I just kind of like got off bar and walked there and I was like, oh, wow, (laughs) this is not what I was expecting. And it caught me off guard a little bit, but I was watching the other poets and I think we were, it was like that mutual feeling of like, wow, there's a lot of people (laughs) outside kind of thing. So that helped me realize like we're all kind of going through this. I want to shift to talking about Aperture a little bit. Michelle Lynn, who's one of the Literary Showcase Committee members, she referred to your work as raw and real and interdisciplinary. Mm-hmm. How would you respond to that? That's very kind, first of all. Um, well, in a very, like, joking, I guess, way, I'm the major I'm doing is interdisciplinary studies at Cal, so it, like, I, I can see that, I guess. Um, I try to be as honest as I can in my poems and as real as I can be because, I mean, this is my space to do that. This is my space to say, you know what, this is my truth. This is how I'm going to express my truth. And if it's not fitting in your ears very well, then I'm, there's nothing, I'm, like, I'm not going to apologize about it. Like, this is just, this is my truth. And I think, like, the beautiful thing that has happened because of this is my sister and my mom and I have able to have have been able to have conversations that wouldn't have happened if I like didn't email them a poem one day <laughs> like low key <laughs> this is what's going on kind of thing or just different with different people in my life like this has allowed me to feel more free and to feel more in touch with who I am instead of putting on different masks every day because that's exhausting and I am here to live in my queerness, my brownness, my all of the different identities and the different privileges I have and the different um, intersections of my identity too, like to own it and to be accountable to it and 
also to work and to do work for the community. Shivani, you are very generously going to share a new piece that you'll perform at the Aperture Literary Arts Showcase on October 7th. Read Zindagi and Speak Magic. As my feet heart beat onto the earth, and I teach myself to chant poems to an audience of only my body as meditation or medication, I forget blood in my veins still breathes, a moon dreams above me, and Nani says there are gods above that moon. Instead, I remember how he put another drink in my hands, how he told me he liked the way I dance, how he scoffed at my accent, how he asked me to keep talking, how he looked at my face with eyes the same color as mine, but how his gaze turned my body into object named exotic, how he... I forget Nanny sleeps peacefully, 12 and a half hours away. She misses mother more lately, and mother probably makes chai for father at dawn. Instead, I remember how his teeth tore at my neck, how he was eating too loudly to hear my refusal, how I became dinner at night and how I didn't eat dinner that evening, how he said my wrists look nice so small, how he held my wrist with his entire body to remind me I am not enough to leave, how he... I forget little sister laughs, creates enough light to intimidate the sun, and she turned 13 last week. Instead, I remember how my lips dragged the jagged sentence you are hurting me out of my throat only to find his laugh cut my skin into nothing more than paper. How I did not bother to pick up the shreds. How I suddenly forgot my tongue was my tongue, not his tongue. How I did not know this tongue can taste anything more loving than quiet. How I found the word queer somewhere hidden in my stomach, spit it at him with a knife sharper than his laughter how he dropped my wrist on top of the shreds and forgot to say thank you for feeding him, how he forgot. I forget the zindagi is magic. So as my feet continue to heartbeat onto this earth, I teach my lips to chant poems to an audience of only my body as medication or meditation, learn how to write recipes for lines tasting like kheer, Rinse my mouth to unlearn the bitter residue of a world with men not raised to listen to my voice, so all the words I forgot during his feast can finally relearn their appetite. As I lift my wrists from shreds of my skin, my tongue becomes daughter, grandchild, Didi, of broad words. I read blessing and speak prayer, read nani and speak shanti, read brown and speak powerful, Read gods and speak mother. Read son and speak sister. Read zindagi and speak magic. Read zindagi and speak magic. Read zindagi and speak magic. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was so powerful. Tell me more about the title of the piece. Zindagi means life. So it's kind of me telling myself that especially in terms of writing, I'm building off of women of color, brown women, Indian women, South Asian women, people before me in my family who've experienced life, who've put the pen to page, who haven't put the pen to page, but have had experiences. Like those are my roots and I'm here because of those roots and now I need to continue to affirm myself because of the trust and love that was put into me and came before me. Mm-hmm. I've noticed in the pieces that I've seen you perform, so this one and then Dear Sanjana from, um, that I saw you perform at the Youth Speaks Grand Slam, your work really draws on the strength and the trauma of the women in your family. Why is this something you find yourself returning to? I think healing is really important. And I guess I've been told to take care of myself by a lot of women who don't take care of themselves. And so it becomes this cycle of us not taking the time and space to, one, understand that we've been impacted by certain actions, words, events, and then to take time to put love into ourselves and heal our bodies and our spirits. And 
I think I keep returning back to it because it's how I'm healing and how I'm healing based on what has happened to me, based on what I've seen with the women in my family, based on what I'm feeling from generations that I haven't even talked to, but that trauma is still being carried because it wasn't healed in generations before. And I guess this is like a process of the, if I have a daughter or whatever gender of that child, like if I have a child, then I'm doing that healing and they can not have that as much of that weight on them. And sometimes I'm not even thinking about that. I'm just thinking about like, I need to get this off my chest. And sometimes I'm thinking like, I have never actually voiced this and my notebook is the only person (laughs) that knows about whatever is happening, whatever I'm feeling and thinking. And that's why I'm always returning to it because it just feels so central to who I am. Yeah, I think this is something that's so common for children of immigrants. Whatever generation you are, there's always this this process of healing yourself and then wanting to heal your family of past traumas too. So I'm wondering how has the experience of being the child of immigrant parents influenced your writing? I think it's influenced my writing a lot. Like my parents, my sister have instilled in me this value that family is number one. And so when I'm writing, I'm also thinking family is number one, you know, like how do I bring that into my writing also? And how do I recognize like my dad came from India with a degree that itself is a lot of privilege as an immigrant. And I'm the first person to get educated in this country, but my dad got educated in India. Like, how do I hold that privilege? And also, like, how do I hold that privilege, keep myself accountable, and also find ways to use where I'm at to give something? And I'm still working on that piece. I think I'm always going to be working on that piece. But... Their journey, my parents' journey here, affects me. I've watched them through a lot of it and watching the up and the down and like it all adds up and it all sits in me and the best way for me to process is to write it down. (laughs) So it's been a pretty short period of time for you between when you competed in the Youth Speaks Grand Slam, you went to Brave New Voices, um, and now you're going to be part of this Aperture Showcase in the next few weeks. Do you feel like in that period of time that your writing has evolved? I think I'm constantly trying to involve my writing. So I'd like to say yes. Um, I don't know what it looks like from an outside perspective, but I know I've been really in that poetry grind and I make sure I put something on the page every single day, like even if it's like an affirmation to myself or if it's something somebody said or a word I heard or if it's the start of a poem, like that has helped me through the evolving process because before BNV and before applying to Aperture and before being in these spaces, I would let it go very easily. I'd be like, that doesn't matter. I'm just going to keep going with my day and do the work I need to do and da-da-da. But now I'm refusing to let those thoughts and those voices go and really being intentional about how much I am putting into my art and like it's still hard like every day I'm like I have homework I'm a student I'm a sister I'm I work at a bookstore like there's all of these different things going on but in order to grow as a writer and to continue to push my boundaries and challenge myself as a writer and not stay in um, zones of comfort then I need to be putting the pen on the paper. And do you feel like the subject matter that you're willing to tackle is is also evolving that you're starting to feel more free to explore different aspects of your experience or your identity? I always say that there's always a poem I'm avoiding to write. <laughs> so even right now I can think of all these poems that I'm too scared to write and too scared to put on paper, but the reads in the Gita and speak magic piece like a month ago from today I would not feel comfortable writing that or sharing it and so I I think it's constantly just pushing my boundaries and realizing that it's okay if I'm still hiding some parts and it's okay if I'm still working through things because that's just what 
that's what growing looks like and feels like and it's not going to be comfortable but that uncomfort means that I'm committing to growing. So what is scarier to you then? Is it scarier to confront those experiences with yourself or is the idea of sharing it with people scarier? To be honest, they're both pretty scary. (laughs) Sometimes it's really, there's lots of pieces of my experience that I can have conversations of with myself in my head and nobody will know about it. And sometimes, but unless I get to that point, I can't share it. So I guess like the first piece is like that fear of just talking about it with myself. And then once I get over that, being able to sit in front of a person and be like, this is, and it also depends on who it is, like with my mentors and with the people in my close circle, I trust them to hold me down. And so that's not really a concern for me. I think that's just because of the fact that I've been very, very lucky and the people who've come into my life and the compassion and empathy and the hearts that these folks have that I get to call like my close friends. So do you and perhaps your mentors kind of push you to confront certain things or do you just let that process happen organically when it needs to happen for you? Mm, I think that's more of an internal thing. Once it's on page, then it's, then I can go to the folks who are supporting me and be like, okay, well, this is the truth. And this is like a piece I'm working on. Like, how can we strengthen the piece? But unless I have that conversation with myself, then it's, it's hard to articulate it with someone else because I haven't even had the words to put it together. So are you in the process of writing additional pieces for the Aperture Showcase? Yeah, I'm working on some. I'm still editing some pieces. I've, I'm always, like, I was editing this piece on the BART over here. Um, yeah, I'm working on different pieces, trying to unpack certain intersections of who I am, different privileges, different ways I've been affected by the whole world, <laughs> um, different expectations placed on me. Yeah, it's, just trying to navigate it and constantly revise and revise and edit. Which other writers are inspiring you right now? Ariana Brown. Ariana Brown is one of my favorite poets. And I've said this since the beginning of my Youth Speaks journey too. Like Ariana's writing is very, it just seems so grounded and so rooted in Ariana Ariana's journey and Ariana Brown and Safia El Hilo too, both of them are two really incredible women of color that I look up to a lot and they don't really know that because I've never interacted with them really. But they remind me about how important it is to get into those uncomfortable places and to just talk about whatever I'm refusing to let myself think about kind of thing and to be grounded in those roots whether it's like culture, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's age, whether it's socioeconomic status, like to be very, very in touch with that and to share. Great. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you for giving me this space. That was Shivani Narong in conversation with Apex contributor Sierra Lee. Shivani will be performing as part of Aperture tomorrow night at the Art Gallery in the city. You can find details on that, the Performing Artist Showcase, film, and more at Kearney Street Workshop's website. And now for the Apex Community Calendar, the book launch for Good Girls Marry Doctors, South Asian American Doctors on Obedience and Rebellion will be Thursday, October October 13th from 6.30 to 9 at Southern Exposure, 3030 20th Street. I'll be kicking it there. Also, Saturday is Life is Living, October 8th, 10 to 7, Little Bobby Hutton Part, Something for Everybody. 
from a kid's zone to free breakfast, skate park, dance stage, amazing theater, and the coup is headlining more at lifeisliving.org. Kearney Street Workshop brings the voices of Aperture 2016. You can find all that at Kearney Street Workshop's website. Apex Express is produced by Marie Che, Ellen Choi, Tara Rabji, Salima Hamarani, Preeti Mangala Shakar, Robin Takayama, and Michael Shikita. Yoshida Tonight's Show was produced by Sierra Lee and myself. I've been your host, Tara Rabji, with Mike Biggs at the board. Up next is Bonnie Simmons.